Good evening, church. Welcome to our midweek service, the second part of our parenting uh, classes that we're having. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about that 11 years and up until they're out of the home type age. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're grateful that we have uh, the leaders of the Ottawa Church, Tony and Melanie Singh. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! We got a chance to mine. Uh, their insights, their wisdom. My wife and I, uh, we saw them raise their children uh, uh, since they were kids. Ruth actually babysat a couple times for their those kids, and which is unbelievable because your boys could crush her. But, uh, <laughs> but anyways, you know, Church, I know the real reason you're here, of course, is uh, to hear those two jokes. Of course. But before we do, I'm going to get Illuminate to open us in a prayer, and then we'll get into it. Right. And let's pray. Father in heaven, we're uh, grateful to have this opportunity to talk to the Sings. We uh, pray that you would just make this um, just such a worthwhile time for, um, for everyone who's listening, God. I pray that as we talk about our preteens and teens, that, um, Lord, the, the things we discuss will really meet the needs of, um, of people as we, as we listen to what the Sings have to say. Uh, thank you for them making themselves available. Uh, I pray, Father, that you will be honored by all that comes from this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, here's joke number one. Why can't you borrow money from a shrimp? Because they're shellfish. Uh, <laughs> mm. What? What do you get when you put a vest on an alligator? You get an investigator. <laughs> I apologize. I need to come a lot more frequently to Detroit. I just see this. I, I, I don't want to apologize. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, this is what we deal with. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons I asked uh, Tony and Melanie was, honestly, I was truly just, uh, as a young man, inspired by uh, the rapport you had with your kids. Even I, And you talk about, and Michael, I remember, was a very rebellious child. I actually saw Michael when he was like five, and it was like, you said, come here. And it was almost like his body physically couldn't. He'd be, ah! He'd move one <laughs> limb at a time. <laughs> Because he was so rebellious, yeah. but obviously uh, he's, uh, he's he's graduated, married, uh, part of the great campus, um, and uh, just they're all great people, is what I want to say. And uh, uh, Michael, what what campus uh, was he a part of? Can I? What school did he go to? Your youngest? You have FIU. Justin? FIU. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Justin, uh, their oldest, uh, Ashley, their middle, and Michael, their youngest. All three are married. Um, I wanted to start off this uh, question part, and I just wanted to get a little bit of your guys' uh, personal uh, viewpoint and philosophies on the importance and the difference between these ages as they get older, that, that pre-teen, mid-teen, young teen, and, and how parents, because we've got parents listening in, and some of them are, 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 the, are parents of 12-year-olds, some of them got a 14-year-old, and some of them have a 17-year-old girl or an 18-year-old boy that, you know, and, and obviously we had to lump it together. But can you tell, tell me, guys, some of how you view those ages differently? What are the important things as a parent to consider? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you know, one of the things, let me say this uh, before I even continue. One of the things that we really did was sought help from people and we asked a lot of questions and we read books and so on and so forth. And, you know, um, I think we've got a number of books that we will suggest uh, that, that really helps shape our minds. But here's one thing that's really, really important. As the kids now are getting older, they're having a mind of their own. Mm -hmm. right. And so uh, a lot of times what we did earlier when they were younger was to help them with, uh, so that they don't hurt themselves for safety and, and those kinds of things. Underlying that, of course, we're teaching them some spiritual principles. Mm -hmm. But now they're getting older, it is very important that you're shaping and forming their heart even in a more intentional way. And, and I think it's, it's very, very important. So there's a mind shift in terms of as they're getting older, 
what are we teaching them, how are we teaching them, and how frequently are we teaching them these things. And the approach is different as they have now their own uh, mindsets. I think, too, you know, we're talking about how reasoning doesn't work with the younger kids. This, this is the age when, you know, Tony mentioned critical thinking. This is the age, preteens and as they got older, we started to teach them. We would ask questions like, son, you know, Ash, why, why did you do that? Explain to me what was going on in your mind. I want to understand. Like, we wanted to know where they were at, what, what were they thinking, where did they get that from? Um, I think with our kids, they had already at this stage understood that discipline was a part of their life. And so, you know, at the preteen stage, we didn't stop disciplining, you know. It, it, the discipline changed, and it became more of, um, you know, this, this is something that you love to do. This is, you're not going to be able to do that. And with the boys, video games were just like mm. their God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes. So that was really? like a true, that was a true punishment. You know, for us, putting Justin in his bedroom was not a punishment. He loved to be alone. <laughs> so yeah. that was not a punishment. That was not mm. a time up. That was like, yes, I get away from this, this interaction. <laughs> so I think that like us learning to figure out how they thought because each of them was so different and then finding that, that appropriate discipline that actually hurt them. And I remember Connie T. when saying, no matter what you exercise, it's got to count. So therefore, as a parent, we have to think about that. We have to think about each of our kids. And I think we learn this midway through with Ashley because I think we started out our parenting disciplining each kid exactly the same you know and and we learned that at particularly at this age discipline will shift and change depending on the child and depending on their personality and the things that they specifically struggle with um you know I, I think it took us a little bit of time to figure that out but I'm glad we did because that really matters with kids. And because I think as you get to the teen age and the little bit older teen age, the dialogue between parents, what you're hoping is happening at that age is you're hoping, hoping that you are an influencer in their life, that you've, you've developed a relationship and a rapport and you have the respect, but that you are an influencer. You're not in that particular time in their life, particular, particularly when they're older teens, you're not a director. You're not, an, you're not primarily this authoritarian relationship where you tell them what to do and they better do it. Like, if that's what you're doing when they're older, that's, it's, you know, I don't want to be discouraging, but that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in our opinion, that's you. There's a battle. There's another battle you have to fight if that is the predominant disposition towards your children. Mm, right. Right. Totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. You know, uh, this what you guys were talking here about, like that relationship and building that relationship um, and being an influencer. How you know, right now my kids are small. We've got two daughters, but thinking ahead, you know, when when they get to that preteen and teenage. Um, how do I, as a dad, you know, build a bond, like a strong bond with my daughters, you know, where, where, where they'll actually care what I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, so let me, let me start, uh, from as a dad, if you hear me say nothing else in the next few minutes uh, that we're going to be doing this interview, hear me say this, mm. spend time with your daughter. There is no such thing as spending too much time. I unfortunately heard a minister tell another member of the congregation they're spending too much time with their children. I almost fell off my chair. Mm. And um, and because uh, there's no such thing. There is no getting back time. Now that my kids are gone mm. from the home, I miss them terribly. And so, but above and beyond that, figure out what things she like. This is a, this is the this is the important thing about not herd mentality in regard to raising your children. What does she, what is her love language? 
Mm -hmm. For our daughter, she loved shopping and still does love shopping <laughs> to this day. <laughs> and of course, we don't have a limitless budget. And so sometimes what we would do, uh, thanks to my wife's guidance, go to a thrift store. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the truth is, thankfully, uh, my daughter could be satisfied with something that is not that expensive. She just, the thrill of buying something was more important than even what it was. Now, I multiply by a billion if it was a really, really expensive thing, but now she, her, mm -hmm. she realized she lives in reality. And, uh, but but her finding, spending time and, and for a period of time in, in, with Ashley and I, it was not, oh, we're going to sit down and look at each other face to face and talk. As a matter of fact, it's a general idea um, in our opinion uh, that with our teenagers is actually be in the car and drive and talk uh, and, and facing forward. Um, sometimes, of course, you've got to have that face to face. But that time, it's a very, very important. It, it's not, this is not a forced time. So that's what I would do. Find out what they like, do those things, find out what their love language is. Mm -hmm. That's great. Stuff. great. Um, so how about when it comes to mother and son relationship? Uh, can you comment on that and how did you guys transition from treating them as little boys to now they're probably taller than you kind of thing? No, not probably. <laughs> 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 <Not know>, <laughs> <laughs> and if you could also speak on how to treat them with respect as they transition older. Yes, that's, that's a huge thing as they get older. So this doesn't necessarily apply as much to preteens as the older teens, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Mother-son relationships are similar to father-daughter. My boys and I love comic books. We love comic hero movies. We love all those things. I grew up with two brothers, and so... Um, that that was our thing. Like Mother's Day, it uh, uh, um um, what what's the movies? Uh, uh oh, my brain. Avengers. Avengers. That for whatever reason, Mother's Day was when they released all the movies. So that became for years my Mother's Day gift, and it was just me and the boy. Tony would stay home. Um, so it was, and to this day, like if if I'm watching a movie that's related to a comic book. I'll call my sons up and go, okay, I'm missing something in the story because there's obviously a backstory if you read the comic books. And so we have this fun sort of connection with that. Mm, I think wow. respect wise, um, I, I still expected my boys, you know, in the preteen years to be respectful of me. And I, and I, like, if they talked to me in a tone that I felt like it was disrespectful, I'd be like, excuse me, no, stop why don't you say that again? <laughs> like, why don't you try that again? <laughs> but as my oh. kids got older, um, you know, again, Connie too, and I'll reference her a lot because she taught me so much. She was like, Melanie, you know, a good rule of thumb, and it's not for everybody, but if you're, if you're pointing your finger up, you, you <laughs> it should tell you something about the, 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 the change in your dynamic with your sons. Mm. She was like, men <laughs> learn how to receive respect from a woman by the respect they get from their mothers. Yeah. And so I was like, what? <laughs> that made no sense to me. But, but she said, you're, you're now teaching your young men what respect from a woman looks like. Mm -hmm. And if they've seen you model it in your relationship with Tony, but now they need to see you model it with them. And so my correcting them, um, it took on a very different approach because I wanted to teach them that I, I have a great deal of respect for who you are. And that's, that's a nuanced thing, right? That's something you have to kind of first feel in your heart, but then you also have to figure out how, what does that look like in my communication with them? Mm -hmm. And that's tricky. It took me some time to figure that out because if I'm being honest, there's a lot of times when I wanted to do the whole like, <laughs> you know, um, that took me some time to figure out that look like in my relationship with both my boys so you know uh, um both with your 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 ch your boys and your girls but uh, in particular for the girls um i remember and mel ashley still refers to this uh incident we were in the mall one time and there were some guys that were treating her in a disrespectful manner and i 
She's never seen me like this before. I walked up to the boys and I w went straight into their face and I said, you better stand down right now. And, and to, in other words, what was important that she understood, but my dad is fiercely protective of me mm -hmm. in a good way, not, yeah. not, not a smotherer, but protect her. And there's a big difference there. Okay. And, and, uh, and so, and even with your boys, your kids need to understand my, my parents are fiercely protective as a scripture describes a bear with her cubs at times. And like I said, not smothering. That's not, that's a different time for another different discussion, but they need to understand my parents will stand up for me. <laughs> he, act he actually said to them too, that's my daughter you're ogling and catcalling. Yeah. <laughs> like he was so embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah. That they were so embarrassed. And she was super embarrassed, guys. But yeah. later on, it's what she remembered. In the moment to a teenager, that's, you know, oh my gosh, oh. dad. But wow, did it have an impact on her. Mm. So. That's great. Thank you, guys. Um, That's awesome. I, I had a question about our teens and the, and their spiritual interest levels. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what do you what do you guys suggest when um, you know our teens aren't interested or, or don't want to come to church or, or church events? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how do you handle that, and how, how do we help them? You know, grow in that interest. You know, a lot of these, as they get older, are nuanced questions, right? In in terms of, there's no formula per se. But there are principles by which we guide uh, our, our children. So I think that, too, is a fantastic question. Um, you know, one of the general rule of thumb is that when the kids were in our home, living in our home, we came to church on Sundays. That's, that, that was established from the very bottom, uh, from, from a long, long time. That was a non-negotiable in our minds in terms of Sunday attendance. This is what the family does on Sunday mornings. And um, in regard to devotionals and so on and so forth, meaning like uh, teen devotionals and, and so on and so forth, that's where it gets a little bit more nuanced. And uh, I don't remember, babe, exactly what age, because um, uh, one of our kids is not yet a disciple. And so what, when did she, mm -hmm. at, at what age? Yep, I remember this. So, so I don't, you know, again, every kid is different and um, each of them have their own things that they have to, to wrestle with as they get older. Our daughter, our middle daughter um, has mental health challenges. She actually has a mental health illness. And so she, and she never really, you know, as she got into those teen years, she never really had difficulty with going to church. Um, I think she had difficulty with, things she felt in church, you know, um, she felt uh, attacked by other disciples um, for what she felt like was who she was. And so, um, so she needed a lot of help. You know, we went through counseling with her. Um, and one of the things the counselor asked us in, in our three person session was you guys, according to your daughter have communicated that, um, her choosing Christ and choosing your church is, is her choice, that it's not your choice as her parents. And we said, absolutely, we, we don't ever want her to do it because of us. And he asked us, what decisions have you given her that empower her to believe it's her choice? And at that particular time, she had to go to everything. And so we had to talk as a family about what we felt like were things that were important to us, but things that would get, make her feel like, no, this is your choice. And there were certain things for her at that age. Devotionals at that age were very difficult for her because that was the main environment where it was just teens and where she felt like she was not an accepted person in that environment. And so it actually hurt her. She started to look at the church in a negative way. And so we're like, well, that's not actually helping her faith at this time. Um, and so we, we came to the decision with her that it was, she was about 15, I think. And we said, you know, what, what things do you want to go to and what things do you not want to go to? And so summer camp, she wanted to go to that. She loved the experience of summer camp. Um, the teens used to have special activities. She loved those things. 
Um, but she didn't want to go to Friday night devotionals and she explained why she didn't want to go and we're like, okay. So, so it was, Justin, you know, he didn't have any difficulty with devotionals. Michael was very athletic. He had, you know, he was involved always in sports and activities. And so we had to kind of figure out, and, you, and I think you're going to talk about that unique thing, but we had to figure out with him um, what he went to and when he did it and wh- how he communicated. We always felt like it was very important for him if he was going to miss a devotional because he wasn't missing because he didn't want to, right? It was like, okay, you need to communicate with whoever the leader was at the time. Let them know what you're doing. Uh, make sure that you're following up and finding out what they we'll talked talk about. about so. Yeah. Uh, it, the, the idea here is, is also relationship is paramount. Okay. The church is people. And, and, and so we made it a priority to form relationships with people who had similar age. Mm-hmm. And, 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 so, and so the kids uh, uh, went to a lot of church activities and a lot of uh, church. They loved church because of the relationships that they had with other people. And, and so it was not, oh, I don't have time to. I had to make it a priority in my schedule. And I say this, uh, you know, I had some significant responsibilities in the congregations that I was a part of, but I needed to clear time in my schedule to form relationships with these parents who had similar uh, age children. And so I did a lot of driving and they did a lot of driving and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so I, I cannot emphasize the importance of that in your schedule and your dynamic, and it actually helps them to love what the church is all about. Mm-hmm. Because if the church is not relationships, it's not anything. The church is not activities. We know that. The church is relationships, and we just do things together, right? And, and, and so that's, that's the whole idea of, of, of mm-hmm. creating an atmosphere of our church and our church family being a great place to go to. I mean, for a number of years, we went to vacation with two other families for seven years in a row. Wow. And, and, um, and, and, and these, they were friends. Yeah. And, and I think it's a very, very important. For my son's 16th birthday, me and him and a, a friend of his who's part of church and his dad went on a cruise together. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and so they'll, they'll never, we still have pictures and they'll never forget that to the day they die is yeah. that those are the relationships that we formed. And, mm-hmm. um, and so it, I, if I was too busy to form those relationships, then I was too busy. Mm. So. Amen. That's great stuff. Um, I, I want to ask a question that I think can scare some parents when they realize that it's happening especially if they don't know what to do. Um, well, you know, what do you do as a parent when you can tell your kid likes somebody, you know, and, uh, you know, they're starting to get serious about liking a boy or a girl. What do you say? You know, maybe they tell you directly or maybe you just know because you've overheard them talking. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there are a lot of ways that you can find that out, huh? Uh, and uh, sometimes through a third party, sometimes through the, uh, the social media or what have you. But, uh, uh, here, here's, <clears throat> this is not a time to confront, confront, to be confrontational. I mean, first of all, to have that dynamic with your children at this point in time, uh, to have a, a heated confrontation um, is, is not what we want to do. Um, I, I, think, I think it's important to sit down and talk with your children about these kinds of things. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important that the way that your marriage is in your home paves a, 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 a framework for your children to understand how to treat the other sex, how, what respect looks like. And I say this, believe me, not arrogantly, but my kid, our kids will come back all the time and say, mom and dad, I did not realize what your life and your marriage is like until I go and visit my parents, my friend's parents. And, um, and, uh, and, and it's like, uh, and, you know, some of the greatest 
greatest uh, sharing is when my kids were sharing at our uh, wedding anniversary and they said, you know, if we could have a, a marriage half as good as yours, we would, we would love it. So in other words, the home and the framework that you have within your house and the dynamic, and it's not pretense, they, you can't fool your kids. <laughs> you, you can fool other people that you see an hour a week but not your kids that are living with you and they know what you're like. Right. And, and, and so it's really, really important that you form that dynamic. The kids learn how to treat their um, spouses, their husband and their wives, uh, based on the way that they have seen us. So example is of paramount importance and not to be confrontational when you're talking with them and don't be afraid, on the other hand, to broach the subject. And, um, and I find, depending on them, uh, who it is, the more direct, not confrontational, but the more direct you talk about it, hey, is this true? Are you interested in this person? And I'm you coming up, I'm help, I want to help. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to, I don't want to hurt, I want to help. So mm -hmm. what do you think, babe? I don't know if I have much to add to that. <laughs> I, that was I, I was gonna, I, I mean, I, I, I was going to say, how can you add to that? <laughs> but I, but that's, that, that, that's the way we work, especially. It, it's touchy. It's, it's very, very important that we, are, we understand their nuances to yeah. this kind of stuff. And I, I, maybe I'll just say this, that each kid was different. In, in some of our kids... We're happy to talk about it, and some of our kids are very secretive about it. And mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was this, when it was secretive, it was very difficult to negotiate those conversations. And I will say, we did not always handle those well, um, As, especially with our me with our daughter. I mean, my and I'm going to share from a, a don't do this perspective. I got upset. I mean, visibly upset. Uh, on, and uh, of course, in my mind, I justified uh, you're being deceitful. This is wrong, and 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 honestly, it it caused a lot of hurt. And I, I'm saying this: don't do what I did there. And uh, and now uh, it's uh, it's the most awesome thing. I I literally love my kids, and they love they yeah. love us, and uh, <clears throat> that's. That's a really, really good thing. I think it's also just scary, too, for us as parents, right? When they start liking the opposite sex, we just, our minds go a thousand places. And I think, I think that's a lot of times where we start to parent out of fear. Because we're so fearful of the world and what's out there and what, you know, um, yeah, it's just awesome. <laughs> read the question yeah I, I you know i appreciate what you guys are sharing as you're you know talking about just how we can handle these different things i, I think the one of the challenges the parents feel you know you, you get used to parenting your child a certain way and then then all of a sudden they're teenagers and it's like how do you how do you handle that uh that transition how do you um you know navigate the need to set limits on things mm -hmm. right um, whether it's like phone use or um, modesty in the case of, I guess, maybe girls and guys um, or dances, dating, all that type of stuff. Um, but then also allowing them freedom as they are becoming young adults, right? I, I find a lot of parents have a hard time with this. Yeah, one of the things that, that it comes to parenting, and let's say your kids have grown up in the congregation. Okay, of course, we convert people and they, they come in with teenagers and, and or uh, so. But let's, let's speak from this vantage point that their kids have grown up in the congregation. A lot of stuff that you do earlier is creating the foundation for what you do now. Mm. Um, uh, um, there, there are a lot of common mistakes that people make in regard to this time in people's lives. They try to exert too much uh, control. And uh, by the way, control overall is an illusion. Control of our kids is a greater illusion because we, yeah. we think we should, right? And, um, and, and, and so that's, it, it's really, really important. You know, um, coming to when we were having a discussion here about all the stuff with 
COVID-19, how are people, the government approaching it, the racial tensions. We had a family meeting, meaning Melanie and I and the kids and their spouses had a, a discussion about it. And it's awesome to hear them share that one of the things that you guys, mom and dad, one of the things that you guys taught us is to have crit be critical thinkers. And mm -hmm. to be able to not just take things the way they are, but to evaluate and, and, and see things through a filter. And I couldn't be more proud when I heard mm -hmm. them sharing of this. And I said, wow, they actually got what we were talking about. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there are some of these things that you are going to be doing are difficult decisions. There's no question. The best Father's Day card I ever got from one of my children was when Michael said to me, he says, and he wrote, he wrote in a note, he says, Dad, I know... I know you have made a lot of difficult decisions um, and it was not easy for you, but I want to thank God for you for making those difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you know what the amazing thing is? Our kids are gone. They call us all the time to ask for advice, all the time. And, uh, and, and it's like I have no expectations of them doing that, none, zero. And yet they call about all aspects of mm -hmm. it craziest thing on the night of my son's wedding he's talking uh, the night before he's talking about his intimacy with his new wife and it's like what well, you know mm -hmm. i mean in other words it got to the point where we're talking about every single thing and it was not a forced thing but you teach your kids uh, about about certain things and you don't try and control them and like i, I noticed that word said try because you can't um it, it's very very important doing anything out of fear is not a good thing mm -hmm. parenting out of fear believe me produces the worst thing trust the principles of the word of god trust the people in your life and when you train your children they will not depart. Our daughter, who's not yet a disciple, absolutely believes she will become a Christian. She, she said it, not, not implied it. She absolutely thinks she's going to become a Christian. And, uh, and, 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 and so I say that to say that it's really, really important. One of the things, let me say one more thing. I remember one of the difficult decisions we had with our, children, with our kids, um, with Michael especially, um, I said to him, I said, you know, God has given me a responsibility to raise you with the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. I need your help to do that. Mm -hmm. This is how you can help me. I will shirk my responsibility if the responsibility that God has given me, I'm not doing a good job with it. And, and, and so there's a, that's a different discussion than when they were young teen uh, kids, right? Mm -hmm. and the, the discussion now is this is a partnership and it's not a control relationship. And let's talk about what, uh, what is it that I do? So all these kinds of quote unquote um, negotiating lack of control and, and you realize this is a team effort that we're trying to do. Hopefully we're painting a picture of what, how different it is mm -hmm. relative to when you were teenagers, uh, um, young children below mm -hmm. 10. Yep. Yeah, I think, you know, the question, some of the questions are, are going to be family specific, right? They're going to be, because at the end of the day, principles are the most important thing, but you as a parent are going to live and die by what you teach and what you accept and what you don't accept, right? We can tell you what we did, but I know one of the things Tony and I have never done is we've never looked back and said, somebody told us to do this and we did it and it was wrong because, and see, our daughter's not a Christian. Like, no, we actually embraced what we were taught and it made it our own. And, you know, and every parent, any parent, when, when if they're a disciple and their child does not become a Christian, Disciple struggles initially with that. What did I do wrong? You know, I, what did I do wrong? I did a ton of things wrong, but is that the reason they didn't become a Christian? I don't know. Not necessarily. You know, they are an individual and they, they do have their own heart and mind and soul and need to make that choice. So I say these nuances that we talked about, we grew into them. We made a lot of mistakes. We figured out as the kids were growing, this is not working. We talked to people, we read books. Um, 
we, we talked to people who knew our kids, you know, who saw them and, and it helped us shape what we took on as our own conviction as parents. A, a fallacy is this. I think within our congregation is that we think that baptism at age 13, 14, 15 it are, is a rite of passage. Simply not true. I mean, it's not biblical. There's a reason why the, the prodigal son is in there. The, our, our children, especially as they get teenagers, are unconverted sinners, and they need to be converted. It's not a rite of passage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, they're unconverted sinners that need to be converted. And, and uh, some of them do it 13, 14, 15, 16. Some of them, when they're adults. And so it's very, very important that we understand that. Sometimes parents forget that they are unconverted sinners. And one last thing in, in regard to this, some, some, sometimes some dispositions of people have that I, I'm not sure it's always the best, mm-hmm. that they primarily want to be a friend to their, uh, to their uh, teenagers. Yeah. You should be friendly and a friend, but that is not your primary relationship. Uh, your primary relationship is a parent. And, uh, and the truth is, when you are not that, it's weird. It's, 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 it's the 55-year-old wearing his sat- hat at his side, walking on campus with short shorts, okay? I mean, it's weird. It's weird looking. That's uh, weird. <laughs> yeah, that is weird. And, and so pl- play the role. There are other people who are going to be their friends. Don't be in competition if your children have really good friends. They're, that's not something to be in competition with. I'm not, a, I'm not afraid if my kids have some really great friends. I know who my children are. I know the kind of relationship I have with them. And, I, and nobody's going to replace Melanie and I. And nobody going to do that. But I want my children to have a network of relationships. So don't be fearful of still being the parent just in a different form. You, you're not primarily your part but not primarily a friend to your teenagers. I I absolutely love and second the things that you guys have said. Uh, You know, I know in Milwaukee, you know, we saw, you know, in in other churches, we're seeing kids get converted at 22, 25, 28 years old. Uh, You know, we just recently in uh, Detroit had something like the uh, similar, uh, the the Banks's, uh, kid and, and just you know at later age and it's almost like we scramble back and go oh my gosh you know and and I as a person that worked with Kingdom Kids for over a decade you know I, I, I saw terrible parents see their kids become Christians and vice versa and and my wife and I were we're firm believers that that like you're right it can be a rite of passage but you, you don't know their journey yeah and I think the, 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 to me, the greatest indicator of, of great parenting is the connection with the parent and the character of the child. Yeah. Those are the, and then let God, let that child with character and connection go on that journey. Uh, because as we also know, you can have a 13 year old that gets baptized and doesn't stay faithful in two years. Yeah. Right. And two so, weeks, uh, yeah. Two weeks ago, we had that same situation, a campus student, people who've been in the church forever, her, their daughter got baptized two weeks ago and not, not as a teenager. But two weeks ago as a campus student, happens all the time. Yeah, I think I wanted to highlight what you said, because I don't know if people heard it clearly, but uh, two things, parent not out of fear, Mm -hmm. but also I remember when you guys shared, even a long time ago, that ask your children, how can I be a better parent to you? Mm -hmm. I think not enough parents do that. They assume that they know it all, but as the kids transition to teenage years and older, it's a good thing to show humility, yeah. mm. to display it. Unfortunately, humility is sometimes very out of character for some parents, right. you know, and so that, that's unthinkable. L- yeah. Let me um, ask the next question. It's more for the parents, and that is, the reality is, honestly, sometimes teens are brutal. The things that they say to you, um, their behavior. I mean, they can be mean people. Yeah. Um, super disrespectful. Um, you know, just uh, the stories and things and the way that they can make you feel right. They can basically poop in your, in, in, in your heart. Kind of thing, you know? <laughs> uh, as an individual, how did you guys deal with the emotions that come with, with parenting a teen 
with really bad attitudes and really poopy things that they say and do? There is no pain. None. At least I haven't yet experienced it. But there is no pain like the pain that comes from your children. Uh, saying mean things or doing mean things. I mean, it, uh, you, it, it hurts. And you think, oh, my God, I didn't know I could hurt like that. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, very clearly uh, Michael and I having an argument and where we pushed each other. Never happened before. Mm -hmm. I, I've had one fight in my life when I was six years old, okay? Yeah. And <laughs> I was about to have another one. <laughs> uh, and I say that to say there, and I, I, you can get so angry and so upset, and, and, and so I understand that emotion for mm -hmm. sure. It goes back a little bit, and then tell you how we can navigate through it, is, is to have this idea that it's now a partnership. And I will underscore that, in what we're trying to do. Tell me, you know, in our more sane times, I'll sit and I'll say, you know, it's the first time in my life that I am, I am uh, uh, parenting a child who's a three-sport three child, okay, who, who loves this and has got a lot of... So I'm saying, how can I help you? What is one thing, and not, uh, not overwhelming, what is one thing that I could do different that would help you in you being a son to me. That's what is one thing, not, not 20 things. That is really, really important. But it goes back to this understanding. It's part of the process. Mm -hmm. Having these confrontation. Now, it, having them all the time, that's, that, that's not part of the process, okay? Mm -hmm. Having them occasionally, if, if it happens all the time, that's problematic, okay? If it happens occasionally, then that's part of the process. It's sort of like being a human being. If you're sick all the time chronically, that's a problem. If you occasionally get the flu, that's okay. That's part of you being a human being. Same thing here. It's same that process. So I don't, I don't want to create the image, oh, it's part of the process. I'm fighting every day with my child. No, that's not part of the process. We've got to figure out something there that is problematic. But the idea here is not behavior modification. It is shepherding the child's heart that ultimately this is what you're trying to create. I remember one time Michael said to me, dad, I hate you. Mm. That's, that's not when you grow up. That's what you want to hear. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. I said, Just our brothers and sisters know Michael has got a rep as a great disciple. Oh no. I, 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 I shared in that what it's like, but, um, but he said to me, and then I said to him, by the grace of God, it's okay. I have enough love for the both of us. <laughs> and and, and it, it was, I realized at that moment, it's part of the process. Mm -hmm. My son today, that particular one, I couldn't have dreamed that he would be who he is today. I, literally, if I were to draw the, the script for his life, for what he is today would be too lofty a dream in t the type of disciple he is, the type of son he is, the type of husband he is, the type of uh, a contributing member of society that he is. I say that to say there are principles that we did uh, that the end product has some refining that needs to happen in it. Yeah. Same thing with Justin. Same thing with Ashley in terms of our dynamic and our relationship. I say that to say uh, 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 it's really, really, really important that you, every single day as a teenage parent, mm -hmm. every single day, what is my goal with my child today? Mm -hmm. yeah. And not to be instinctive, but intentional in yeah. your parenting of your teenagers. Let me say that again. Not to be instinctive, but to be intentional with the parenting of your teenagers. That means practically you get up every morning and you're thinking, what do I do today? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we have time, but um, you know, I do think yeah. that the concept of relationship 
not just with your kids one-on-one, but within the family is a really important thing. And I, you know, I, I feel like because from a really young age, we established this, we're going to deal with things, right? Like we're having a family meeting and we're going to deal with what's happening in the family. I think that's produced some of what we have even today with our kids. Um, There was never anything that happened that was big that affected the family that we didn't sit down and talk about. Um, And we didn't always have a solution, but we felt like we, we, we don't get to sweep things under the carpet. So that was a really important thing for us as a family. I just saw that we got to go. Amen. Amen. Um, Yeah, we're we're running out of time, but we uh, super appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to have the Elliot's have the last question here and then uh, we can uh, be done there. Oh, I think they have books to recommend. Oh yeah. And you guys got books to recommend too. Yes. Can't wait to hear those. Yeah. I, uh, I appreciate everything you guys are sharing and along the same lines, I know as, um, Teenagers grow up, we start, you know, parents start becoming uncool in their eyes and want to separate and create as much distance as they possibly can. So I want to ask you guys, how can you still have a strong spiritual impact on your children when they pull away and they seek independence? You know, if you stand, if you stand away from the situation, you realize what you're trying to develop and get less emotionally involved where then it's, it's easier. Okay. You stand back. So in other words, we realize, you know, I'm not trying to be my kids best friends. We're just trying to teach them. We're trying to help them. Um, and, 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 you know, I jokingly said a couple of times to my children, my goal in life is to embarrass you in front of your children, in front of your friends. And of course they know that that wasn't the case, but, um, but uh, 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 they, they realize my dad and mom do not care how they present themselves. And they're not weirdly trying to be uh, cool with their friends, but rather they respected the role that we had in their lives. And our, my kids, all of them, introduced their friends to us mm. and, and 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 that showed what was really 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 important because we they knew when the kids come over we'll we'll get them food and and do all that kind of stuff that we were we were going to take care of them well, we, that was certainly part of our responsibility but to stand apart and not get involved in the emotions and the drama and, and one of the mantra in our house is that i don't do drama very well um, and, and I just, I just don't get caught up in it as much, you know, uh, 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 invariably sometimes you have to, but it's, I don't thrive on it. And I, I try to make sure that we don't have a drama filled house in, um, in, in our lives. And, and I, I think it's very, very important that we communicate that in a very, very loving way that it's not, let me say this, your children and the parenting of them is not about you. It's about them. Mm. And, and, and I'll sh- share with you. And guess who's coming to dinner? That's a movie with Sidney Poitier. There was a scene in the movie where uh, he had a discussion with his father. And, he, and, and his father said to him, I did so much because he was a renowned physician. Right, he became a renowned physician, and and his daughter uh, and his father was a was a factory worker, and, and now he's become this renowned physician. And his dad said, "I think you need to be grateful for what I have done for your life." And then he made a speech that I will never forget. He says, "No, I don't." He says, "That's your role as a parent, and my role uh, is that I wasn't asked to be brought into this world. You brought me into this world." And your role as a parent is to do whatever you can to help your children. Now, wow. And it helped me to understand, wow, that's my role. How my children respond to that? Amen. And believe me, it's been absolutely unbelievable. But my role as a parent is to shepherd my child's heart. Not for them to become grateful to me. That's on them. My role is to shepherd mm-hmm. their child's 
heart. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that that's the overall thing, we don't get caught up in the drama or when there's a, a stumbling block or we stub our toe during this process. So that's the way we've taken out this disposition. And, yeah. and um, you know, that's our, that's our vantage point and that's our opinion. And, and uh, um, so far, so good. I, just a practical on that. Um, we did always try to have our kids be involved with somebody just a little bit older than them, like a college student or, you know, an older teen. In the um, church. Because we did feel like that isn't a role that we're going to be able to fill, but they need that. They need to have somebody who they can look up to and aspire to be like. And so um, that's a tricky thing. It's hard to find. You've got to work at it, right? Like it's because I know parents would come to me as a leader and be like, you know, I feel like people don't want to hang out with my kids. And, you know, can you, can you almost like I had some kind of authority to make another kid hang out with their kid. And, you know, I just say, I'll share with you what I, we did. And, it, you know, you feed a college student and they're going to be at your house, right? <laughs> like, Singles too. And, <laughs> so, I'm just, so I said, that's what we did. We fed them. They came over, we fed them. And then they just somehow got to go downstairs and play video games. And so um, that was just a, it's a, it was an important thing to provide that relation, that kind of relationship. Perfect. That's that awesome. is great. I, I love that. And, and you guys always have loved the youth. You guys were always having young people over and it was, it made it easier, I'm sure, to make a withdrawal that you had put so much equity into these younger people that yeah. when you needed it. And not that's why we pour ourselves into the kingdom, but, but that's what happens is when you guys yeah. are having people over and using your home. Super yeah. appreciate it. Super appreciate everything that you guys have done. I wanted to end asking, you guys had some book recommendations? Yes. Yes. Okay. So here are six books and I'll send you the list. Do, do, do you want us to send you the list? You want us to tell you the books now or send you Go the ahead. list? Tell us the books now and then send it as well and I can just put it out. Okay. Good. So first one, Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp. Um, the second yes. one, Tony, was very impactful for Tony with the boys during adolescence was Raising a Modern Day Knight. A Father's Role in Guiding His Son by Robert Lewis, Wild at Heart by John Eldridge, um, yeah. Parenting yeah. with Love and Logic, um, Preparing Adolescents for Reasonable Adulthood. That was a huge one um, for us as the kids were in that age. Um, and then two books on purity, um, Every Young Man's Battle and Every Young Woman's Battle was also a book that we read with our kids. Um, awesome, awesome. All, uh, I think four of those books... Uh, we've read right three or four of them, Wild at Heart and, and Shepherding a Child's Heart. So super, super awesome. Thank you guys so much. Super grateful. I thought of you guys because of the great examples that you were to us. Love you guys a lot. Thanks for the time and for helping us out. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, so, you much. so much for asking us. We feel honored yeah. and privileged and we could, whatever way we could serve, uh, we would love to do that. So amen. amen. Love you guys. Love you. Okay.